Um, cool. My name is Barb Moses. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Monte Carlo. Um, I'm really happy to be here with Sam Svidkovsky today, um, Director of Data and Analytics at Toka Football. Uh, I'll let Sam introduce herself shortly, just for a little bit of context. Um, Monte Carlo created the data observability category um, in the same way that engineering teams um, use uh, software to make sure that their applications and infrastructure are reliable. Data teams need something similar to make sure that their data is actually reliable and trusted. Um, that didn't exist uh, five to ten years ago. Um, and so at Monte Carlo, we have the great pleasure of joining um, with folks like Sam to help create the category. Um, and I'm really excited to hear Sam's story, both because she has a super interesting personal story, but also a really uh, cool use case for data and a very thoughtful journey. Um, so I'm excited for you all to hear a little bit about her story. Um, Sam, I'll start by letting yourself, letting you introduce yourself. Yeah, Sam Svikovsky. Uh, like I joked earlier, it, it sounds like it's spelled. Um, I am born and raised in Buffalo, New York. Uh, huge Buffalo Bills fan, but now live in Santa Monica, California. Um, I started really my data journey out uh, after my grad program in North Carolina. Um, I started in consulting. I was doing that for quite some time, doing the travel thing, working with all these different clients and learning about all of their data problems and finding out that everyone really has the same problems. It's just different industries, different types of data. Um, from there, I moved to uh, MindBody and I was there for about three years. And actually, that's the first time I had a run in with Monte Carlo which was really great prior to me coming to Toka football, or as Americans, most of us here, we'll call it soccer. Um, so I came to Toka soccer, uh, I think it's almost been two years now, maybe two years in the coming new year. Uh, and it was a really exciting opportunity for me because we're a small company. Um, I have spent a lot of time with bigger companies, um, even though the firms I was with weren't as necessarily big, like I was working with companies like Southwest Airlines, McAfee, and others. And this was a really a new opportunity to work with a small team and start the data program, not necessarily from the ground up, but really develop something into what I could call like my own and our team's own um, data organization. Um, and so since you know coming to Toka Soccer, we've made a lot of strides. Um, a big use case of that or big component of that has been Monte Carlo and our implementation there. Um, and so for those of you that don't know, and I skipped over this, but Toka Soccer, what we do is we use, we have tech enabled soccer training. So we have physical facilities where athletes will come in and we have this, these tech machines, um, they're called the Toka trainers that spit the balls out. And then we have smart goals. So we're tracking everything um, from the ball, how many balls are delivered, how they're delivered out to the players, how fast they go into the goals, how many touches they have on the ball, and we're able to understand what they're doing. We have another part of our business, which you may have heard of for anyone listening from London, which is Toka Social, and that's our entertainment side. Um, so if you've ever been to one of like the virtual golf rooms, for example, we have that, but for soccer. Um, so that's currently in the UK, um, but Predominantly today, I'll talk about Toka Sport, which is that training side. Awesome. Um, so tell us a little bit more about data, Do Toka in particular. What kind of data are you all tracking? What does it look like? And who are your customers as a data team? Yeah, uh, so everybody is our customer as the data team. Like I said, we're, we're, we're pretty small. Um, we have a strong and mighty team. We also utilize some contractors as well. But we are supporting everybody from our operations teams to marketing to strategy um, and our product as well. Um, uh, and obviously leadership is, is a big component of that. Uh, day to day, it's really like, can we help give this data to our stakeholders? So again, operations, marketing, and so on. But also how do we you know, start to think about how we can use data further and beyond just, hey, here's this report um, and, and doing more. <laughs> yeah, awesome. And I'm not sure it's legal to have a conversation today about b data without asking about generative AI. <laughs> so I have to ask you, are you all doing anything with that? Um, what are you all thinking about? Yeah, uh, it's, you do have to ask it. <laughs> um, so 
we right now there's a lot of conversations right we're saying how can ai better support what we do and like i said we support our product as well so that is the actual training the number of balls that somebody is scoring how fast they score really how you know good they are and so one of the conversations we are having around ai is can we support that training with ai can we make the training smarter than it is right now we have a really good team of people that develop the training plans, but we also know that there's probably things there that we can do to make it adjust on the fly so that you won't need a trainer to say, oh, this person's maybe not performing as well as they should be, or do we need to pick up the speed a little bit more? Um, without them having to make that decision, somebody could go in and train them themselves. Very cool, excited yeah. to hear more about that. Me too. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Um, so maybe let's uh, dive a little bit more into your tech stack. So there's sort of uh, various um, uh, uh, sort of phases in, in the journey that you spoke from just getting started from the ground up to actually having a team now that sort of serves the entire company. Tell us a little bit about that journey and how do you think about your, the decisions in, in your tech stack? Yeah, and you know, what's really, I think, what, it was really promising when I first started with Toka is that this tech stack is not much different from when I started. Um, you know, we were utilizing Snowflake, Fivetran, Tableau, um, GitHub to an extent, Airflow, DBT. Really what we've implemented since then have been our data quality tooling, so Datafold and Monte Carlo. Um, but I think the progression really started out with a lot of point-to-point -point building. And so when we talk about just like what we were doing, we would have a stakeholder come to us and say, I need this question answered. And so we'd say, okay, let's go build that. And then another person would come and say, hey, I also need that question answered, but a little bit differently. And so we would like Mr. Potato Head all of these things, right? So we had like, I always use like this Mr. Potato Head that looks like a potato. I hope everyone knows Mr. Potato Head. Um, <laughs> that looks like that. But then all of a sudden we start putting like some feet over here and some ears up on the eyeballs. And it just all of a sudden it was like, this isn't actually what this should be used for anymore. And so what we started to do was say, what does Toka do as a business rather mm -hmm. than this is how this POS system works or this is how this data source works. We started to outline this is Toka. This is what we do. Let's build to that rather than build to how all of our systems are built. Hmm, very interesting. And tell me about a win that you all had as sort of a, as a data team where you were able to really make an impact on the business that you felt like the team was really proud of that. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a. I think it's like the story all this time, right? The first time we were able to email our leadership team and say, hey, we know that data that was sent out of the report this morning was not right before they came and scrambled to tell us that. That was honestly one of the biggest wins I think we've had, and in, in, in this was a while back. It was probably months ago now. But we were able to go to them and say, hey, don't worry. We're, we're working on it. Don't you know, freak out. We know there's zero dollar sales yesterday. That didn't happen. <laughs> um, and so I think that was, that was definitely one of our bigger wins. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. One of the things that's interesting about your story is that you've been very thoughtful about debt along the way. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about sort of the deck? What does that even mean? I think people talk yeah. about data debt a lot, but what does it mean for you all and how have you actually tackled that? Yeah, so for us, like a lot of our data debt was just that point to point building, trying to answer questions. People were using dashboards to answer questions that they weren't meant to be used for. Um, the concept of every report should be a dashboard was, has been a really big one for us as well, where it's mm. just like, hey, I need a dashboard for this. And it's like, well, probably not. Like, let's, uh, let's really start to understand what you need. Um, it goes back to what I said before, though, is a lot of our debt came from this point to point. We integrate a lot of different POS systems because we do have a lot of different services we offer. And there's not one system that really allows us to just have this one source of truth. And so the debt came from, we're going to you know, model customer visits, for example, based on how this company does it, uh, rather than how we define like a visit or a purchase or a transaction. And so 
the proposal that we have put together and have now executed on is we need to really define from the ground what is what is revenue, what are visits, what are bookings, really all of these different terms that we use, align it to TOCA, and then rebuild from there. And how did you measure the success and communicate that to leadership or to anyone where you needed to make the case for that? Often data teams that we work with um, are not sure how to communicate that or struggle to actually communicate the value. Mm -hmm. How do you do that with internally? Yeah, a lot of time. Um, a lot of time and a lot of trust, right? It's, I think it, it, took, it took a lot of almost failures to be able to say, we really need to do this. Our time to complete answering like one simple question, like what was yesterday's revenue? could have taken days or weeks to answer that. And then if we did it again two weeks later, it was a totally different answer. And so as we you know, presented this, it was, it was really talking about the foundation. And I, I know everyone's heard this before, so it's nothing novel, but it's like building the house on you know, sand, right? Um, we really pushed for that foundational view and what we've started to see since then, and I think, you know, it, again, it took a lot of trust to get there, but our time to answer questions is a lot quicker, and I think that's, that's something that's not necessarily, I, it is, you can measure it, but it's also a little bit of a feeling where people are now like, our stakeholders are saying, oh, this is really nice, I don't have to wait three weeks to get this answer when I don't need this information anymore. Yeah, makes sense. A, a lot of folks speak about sort of like, time to insights or, or trust, which is actually pretty hard to measure, mm -hmm. but it's sort of, people talk about it as a feeling, so it's interesting to hear, to yeah. hear you talk about that. Um, so you talked about sort of your data quality, data observability um, journey. Let's double click into that. Maybe tell us a little bit about um, how did you think about um, actually like, you know, not just technology by itself, but like the processes around it that you put. We, we also find that like that's a huge part of the story and the journey and being intentional about that. Um, what, what did you all sort of, you know, what are the processes that you put in place and maybe more importantly, why? Like what, I, I feel like with small teams the decisions that you make matter so much and so what were like, you know, the one or two th processes that you put in place that made a big difference or that can make a big difference for small teams? Yeah, and I need to give a huge shout out to like our data engineer, Shiv, who is I think quoted a lot in the things that we talk about when we talk about Monte Carlo. Um, because he came in with a lot of really good knowledge um, and processes like around CICD and PR reviews and implementing you know, tests and checks and really focusing on getting it right as we were doing it. Um, you know, I'm definitely not the expert in that and I think it's really important to have somebody that is able to push that forward um, so I would say that was a really big piece, is, is making sure that we weren't just building to build, but we were thinking through it, we were implementing the right testing, and then executing from there. Makes sense. And what actually made you sort of start this journey, <clears throat> um, and maybe talk a little bit about some of the things that we're seeing here on, on the, the slide, or how do you kind of think about, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the time that you're investing? Yeah, you know, it actually started when I first started interviewing with Toka, and it was mm. one of the comments was the most important thing was that there's no trust in the data. Um, and so from day one, I knew that was really our priority, was to regain trust um, and go from there. And I, I think, you know, we didn't really start this thorough process until maybe three to six months into uh, me joining Toka, mm. because it takes it took some time to really understand like what we were doing and how to move forward from there, um, and really unravel like the problems. Um, and so again, it's I think it's really just like understanding the situation. A lot of companies go through this, and it takes time to work with stakeholders and leadership to say this is why we need to do this and. Um, you know, it, if, if we keep going the same way we were going, it was never going to change. Yeah, makes sense. 
And I guess uh, more tactically, like what are you all actually doing? Like what does it look like kind of dealing with, you know, a, a fire drill or if you are trying to like build something new, what, you know, how do you all think about maintaining trust throughout those projects? Yeah, so uh, it, it's, it's funny because to us this sounds like a process, but it's probably more of like a, well, of course you would do that. But we've started to really sit down with stakeholders more intensely and say, okay, why are we doing this? What's the outcome? Is this the right way to do this? And then if we decide, you know, it's an analysis, a dashboard, a report, whatever might be needed at that time, we scope it out with them and align on what the end outcome is. And then if we're creating new models or new data um, for somebody, we actually sit down with them and go through a pretty, I say rigorous QA process, um, but it's a lot of going back and forth and seeing if the numbers align to what they're expecting. Um, it's not exciting. Uh, they also don't really enjoy it, but it, we almost get then their stamp of approval, and then we can move it to that production. Um, yeah, it's I, like I said, it's it, it's a it's a good prog process, but it's also just exhausting, um, which I know for the team. But then once it's done and it's there, we know we can trust it. So a lot of our data supports our operations team and the general managers that are in the facilities themselves and running their business because it's not like we're running one, like an online store. We have these individual buildings, everyone has their own business and they're all a little bit different. Hmm. And so they really need their data to be correct every single day. Hmm. And so we've done a lot of work with them to make sure that they have that stamp of approval. So if something looks wrong, it could be from their source system, so they're inputting data incorrectly, or something is wrong and the business needs some help. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and tell us a little bit about uh, sort of, you know, uh, your use of DBT in particular and how has that improved over time, both in building trust, uh, but also just in building resilient data pipelines. Yeah, again, uh, this just goes to like the, analysts and engineers that we have and their continuous improvement and just staying up to date, um, you know, implementing the testing. Uh, we've split our workflows into executive workflows, which are top priority for every single day work. And then everything else, like so if something fails on one side, if the executive flows still run, we have a little bit more time to keep up. Um, I mean, everything like that could possibly be done. I think we're continuously trying to stay up to date on that um, and just stay at the top of the game. Yeah, it feels like it's always easier said than done. You, you make <laughs> yeah. it sound really easy. You just talk to everyone and make sure that they're aligned and then we make it yeah. happen. Um, it's not that easy. <laughs> yeah, obviously. It's a lot of saying no to a lot of people, which I know is not easy. <laughs> yeah, how do you say no? Or how do you decide sort of what to, to balance? Well, you just say no. <laughs> uh, no, I, I say that <laughs> and I always tell like my team like, and they're probably laughing right now, but like, I'm okay being the bad guy. That's fine. And I, I think it's really just digging deep and understanding like what the actual priority is. And people have a hard time doing that. And so if you can make it like, sim simplify a little bit and just say, okay, you've got these three things, order them one, two, three, and the response is, they're all important, then nothing's really important then, right? So it's just, I think it's just pushing really hard on everyone you work with to do that prioritization because I can make that decision every day and just guess at, with some knowledge and data, right? Like we have a general idea of what's important but I think putting that pressure on helps people really understand that. Like, this isn't a, an easy, like, okay, I'm just going to go do this really quick and just get you this answer. But having them understand the impact of changing priorities and identifying what's important to them. Oh, you mean it takes time to actually do that? <laughs> no way. I thought you could you know, get it all done in five minutes. Um, so we don't have a ton of time today. Um, just maybe to wrap up. Thank you so much for telling us the story. Can, yeah. you, can you tell us a little bit about sort of what you're looking ahead? You know, what's um, sort of on your roadmap? Is, you know, you've sort of done this, like, you know, sort of initial phases of the journey. Mm -hmm. What's coming up for you all? Yeah, I think what's really important for us is that we, we have this good foundation now. We're feeling 
the speed to answering questions about just like, I need this data are quicker. And so we're trying to be a little bit more proactive. Uh, we, like I said, we work really closely with our stakeholders, especially our operations teams. So we're trying to help ask the questions before they come to us. Um, some examples of that are like, how do we structure a, a package? Um, how do we most effectively fill our studios with the, like for the best balance of different types of training? And so that's where we're starting, starting to look ahead um, and just work with them on saying like, hey, here's some of the things we can do. Does that spark any ideas for you? Yeah, awesome. Looking forward to hearing more about that next year. Yeah. And then final question, uh, your favorite Ted Lasso character. Yes, I love it. Who watches Ted Lasso? Okay, good. Uh, well, two, Rebecca, because obviously. Rebecca. <laughs> uh, and then Beard. And I actually, I really like Beard, not just because of the humor, but for anyone that does have like a sports background, that assistant coach role is so important. And I think undervalued a lot because Everyone just sees them as like picking up the equipment, doing the schedule, just doing the other things. But they're the ones that have to speak up when they know the coach is wrong. And so I think that is like such an important thing that a lot of times is overseen for the assistant. I love that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sam. This yeah. was awesome. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And Sam will be available for questions. Oh, yeah, questions somewhere.